ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The time is 631. Today's date is Wednesday, June 5th. Do not adjust your calendars. Your calendar is not broken. We're meeting on a Wednesday this week. Uh, our first order of business is... To, uh, we have a member who is coming in remotely. Uh, Ms. Exton, would you please say hello for us and acknowledge that you can hear us? Good evening, I can hear you. Okay, we're having trouble hearing you. So, um, uh, Jenna Medeiros, are you representing uh, AEA? Uh, yeah, okay, we, we're going to need a little volume on the uh, people coming in on Zoom. Um, so we can hear them. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and they are looking at the control. So I'll, I'll continue with the agenda. Next item on the agenda will be um, Arlington High School Student Representatives to School Committee who do not exist anymore because last Saturday we sent them packing with a diploma. They have graduated. They're gone. I think and they still exist, though. Well, they still exist, <laughs> but they're they're no longer students. They're full full fledged adults oh, who are Mike. wandering out there Mike. in the real world. Can we do a test on Zoom real quick. Sure, we can do a, uh, a test on Zoom. So, uh, Ms. Exton, can you talk again? Sure, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me now? That's better. I mean, you're a little reverb, but we can pretend we're 60s uh, rock and roll radio. Uh, Ms. Medeiros, would you say hello again? Hi, I can oh. hear you. Okay, fine. Looks like the system is working. All good. Um, next is public comment. Do we have anyone for public comment tonight? Abigail Vote is on Zoom. Abigail, uh, what we do is we let you talk for three minutes, uh, subject to the school committee policy. Uh, if um, You have to sign up by Thursday. Uh, depending on how many people sign up, if the number of people who sign up exceeds what we could reasonably be done, we, we've done that. Um, so you have three minutes to talk to us, and we typically do not respond. Thank you. Should I begin now? Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Abigail Vogt. I am the mother of a seven-year-old girl, Emily Shantz Vogt, who is in first grade at Hardy Elementary. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge and thank her teacher and all of the staff at Hardy today. So uh, her teacher is Ms. Janig. Um, I was lucky enough to be one of the parents who attended the author presentation today for the first grade at Hardy and it was a fantastic experience to go to Emily's classroom and to see the work that she and her classmates had produced throughout the year and her development and her learning particularly in reading and writing. I've asked to speak today uh, and I'm very conscious that you have enrollments and class sizes already on your agenda for later uh, in this meeting, uh, but I would I am here today to to propose and advocate strongly um, for more classes and smaller class sizes for Hardy Elementary Grade Two for the next school year. Uh, we have had um, a very busy and active year for the first grade, as across all of the grades uh, at Hardy this year. Uh, but we've also had a, a, an experience of lots of social emotional learning needs um, and which have, have come across in terms of extra effort being made by teachers and, and a really intensive focus. We have really appreciated the size of the classes uh, this year and really um, would strongly and keenly advocate uh, that those class sizes be kept 
similar to, to this year when the first grade at Hardy Elementary is going into the second grade. We are conscious that there have been um, lots of focus on both learning, but also that like all the children coming through right now, this class and this grade level is a class that is coming from um, a COVID experience in the time of development and early childhood development in the time of COVID. And we would really um, strongly advocate that the extra care and attention in smaller class sizes with a focus on reading and learning development uh, be really taken into account as um, classes and teachers are allocated for the second grade for Hardy in the next school year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that if anyone else for public comment, hearing none, that concludes public comment. Our next item on the agenda is the Civic Action Project from the Otteson School. Oops. That was the timer for the three minutes. Um, we have the um, uh, School Civic Action Project from the Otteson School. <coughs> With us today, I believe, are Ewan Duffy, Evelyn <coughs> Weinsack, uh, Roz Richmond, and Gwendolyn McNulty. Uh, they sent us all emails, so I decided to invite them to come here and talk to us. You, you can sit over there, too. We can. I'll help them do the introductions. Oh, if, you, uh, if you would be so kind as to introduce yourselves and your teacher. Um, my name's Gwendolyn McNulty. Um, I'm Evelyn Venus. I'm Roz Richmond. I'm Owen Duffy. And, and that's Mr. Backey. Hello, Mr. Backey. I do have one question before we start. Go right ahead. Is it all right if we take photos for um, yes. the meeting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, under Massachusetts <coughs> law, you have a right to record the meeting in any way you want and take pictures of the meeting. So. Uh, it, it, it's um, totally up to you, as long Thank as you. it doesn't interfere with the meeting, and I'm sure that Mr. Backey would not do that. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, good evening, and thank you all for inviting us to present at this meeting. Participating our, in our community is important to us, and we want to contribute to helping our community when it comes to something we believe in, which is why. Um, we have a proposal to solve the issue of East Arlington students being late to school. Um, so a root cause that we identified is that there's not enough school buses provided for Audison students, which forces them to take the overcrowded and unreliable public transportation. So when the buses pass them because they're full and or they do not arrive at all, the kids are late and they miss like valuable time in their first period classes. Uh, to allow students to take different school buses, we propose staggering the start times of different schools. Uh, that would allow for the Gibbs school buses already in East Arlington to pick up students and drive them to OMS. Students would then have the benefit of school buses at the fraction of the cost of getting completely new ones. This would also clear up traffic on Mass Ave as all parents wouldn't be dropping off their kids at the same time. Thank so, you all for taking the time to listen to oh. our proposal. We are one. Though we recognize the difficulty of changing start times and end times and its impact on teacher contracts and extracurricular activities, we believe that it will be worth it in the long run and greatly help students at middle schools and high school. Per the recommendation of the eighth grade assistant principal teacher, Dr. Crawford, it might work well to hold a meeting with parents, teachers, and other parties to determine how to best make the transition to staggered start times and alleviate potential issues. Another action we have taken to reach this goal is to gain Janine Duffy's support, who is the head of the Go PTO and will share and present our ideas to them at their, upco uh, at their upcoming meeting. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to our proposal. We are wondering if you had any uh, questions or concerns? Okay, uh, from members of the committee, through the chair, would you have any questions, concerns, or comments for the presenters? Mr. Thielman. Could you just, uh, thank you, great presentation, very well coordinated, that was nice to see. Who, uh, could you just maybe explain how you got interested in this particular issue? Like, did, did, did you look at some data, or were your friends, were you talk, like, how did it come about? I think that this issue is really prevalent in like our schools and I think that we were, uh, first we decided on a class topic as we voted as a class and then I think that we really saw that the big issue was um, buses were frequently late at our school. I think it happens uh, probably once a week, a bus is delayed. 
and we specified this by um, a cause, an effect of the problem of the buses being late um, is students being late to school, which is where we came up with the idea. I live like in East Arlington and for the first few, for my first few weeks at Austin, I took the school bus every day before I realized that I was late every time I took it. Even if I went to the bus stop at like 7.30 in the morning, they would just not come or they'd be full and then I'd end up having to walk. So that was also like something that, this was a topic that I felt really strongly about because it affected me and my friends at school. So you would say that, that, that students who live closer to the, our only seventh and eighth grade school had an advantage because they can get there on time and those who live farther away, like in East Arlington, did not. That's your, that's kind of a case, okay. Is there, a, I mean, I'm not sure, is there a way for us to kind of uh, explore this further through a subcommittee or is this, what do you think, or is this? It is entirely up to the committee of what it would like to do. If one of the committees would like to invite the students in to have a further conversation, that would be uh, excellent. But then again, you're eighth graders at Odison, so where are you gonna be next year? High school. High school, yeah, okay. But yeah, I don't wanna make extra work for a subcommittee. I just wanted to throw that out if people are interested. I, I don't know. But if they want to come back to us uh, in September when we get back into business, uh, touch base with us and we'll uh, have a conversation. Because I'm sure you'll find a whole new set of issues with getting to school once you're at the high school. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I think it'd be a good thing for the facilities subcommittee to take that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Thank you, Dr. Allison Ampey. That's the committee, the subcommittee I chair. We have a meeting coming up. I, I don't know. Is it going to put it on new business now or yeah? Okay. All right. We have a meeting. Yeah, we have a meeting. When do we have a meeting? Next week. Okay. Yeah. Next week. Okay. <laughs> Come on by. We're, we'll put this, I don't know. We'll put it on. It's, the agenda's posted, but I think we have enough time to modify it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Allison Ampey. <laughs> well, Dr. Holman may have some input first. Dr. Holman, do you have any input? Um, um, I don't know if I have input, but I do have a question. Um, what other solutions have you thought through like did you I know you kind of need to think through like what are some different ways that we could potentially solve this problem are there other ideas besides what you proposed that you tossed around and maybe discarded I'm curious what they are I think we could have another bus but then again that would be very expensive and hard to coordinate mm -hmm. so I think that this option will be more cost effective okay yeah did you what um did you find out about the transportation in town, like when you were doing your research, what um, about school transportation or transportation department with the buses? Um, well, the transportation department is bigger than just our town and our focus for um, this was like just kind of in the town of Arlington and if we decided to focus on adding more buses, it would be something that'd be a lot harder to focus on mm -hmm. and it'd be broader, so it'd be like harder to find a solution. Mm -hmm. We also um, were thinking about how like the MBTA is such a big organization and when you send them emails the only thing you get is like an auto reply and they don't pick up their phones so it's really hard to get in contact with them. At the start um, yeah we were really just looking at the uh, MBTA and then it sort of became like a school bus or also the MB MBTA mm -hmm. like what Evelyn said uh, we just get robot um, responses. Mm -hmm. And also we realized that a lot of the reason why the buses were late was because of traffic. And a lot of that traffic was parents dropping their kids off at school. So that also brought us to where we were, mm -hmm. right there. As a receiver of robot responses from the MBTA, <laughs> I can commiserate with the challenges <laughs> that you face doing your research. And um, the bus that we currently have, we have a school bus that goes to OMS, I imagine you know this. Um, is the one that also transports our students from Boston. And so when it comes to traffic, that bus experiences a whole lot of it. So it can depend on the day um, and the traffic. But this is, these are some good things to think about and some creative solutions that you all have come up with. So I wanna commend you on an important topic that's important to your peers and I know has been very important to you um, and for your very thorough research about it. And if we have more conversations about it, maybe we'll give you a call and see what else you know and what else you would recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just as a note, town meeting passed a resolution this year and last year, both under Article 66, regarding the deterioration of bus service on the MBTA so that uh, 
you might be interested in just following that up. If, if we are successfully getting some of the leadership into Arlington, I'm sure you'd like to come and uh, talk to them. And don't forget to talk to your state reps uh, and state senator. Anything else? June 11th, 4 p.m., you're welcome to come. It's right here. I, your teacher can be in touch with me and I'll figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Job well done. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I'm on the committee. So <laughs> you're there. I know you are. I know you're there. Making <laughs> work for Go ahead. other. I'm not just jumping on that one. I know. Right. Next item on the agenda is the AHS Naming and Memorial Advisory Panel Appointments. Ms. Exton is. Thank on. you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, as the committee knows, um, per policy FFE, um, procedures for naming new spaces at the at Arlington High School, we um, the committee is um, has a responsibility of appointing two community members to this advisory panel. Um, so, on Monday evening, the community relations subcommittee interviewed a number of interested community members, and we have decided to recommend uh, two, uh, two community members, Sharon Grossman and Jason Err, to the advisory panel. Sharon couldn't make it. Jason, uh, Professor Err was hoping to make it. I can't He's see here. the audience. He's here. But I don't he is here. <laughs> Dr. Err is here, yep. <clears throat> um, so Herr, I don't- to come uh, forward and sit I guess, by one of the microphones. Uh, continue, Ms. Exton. Sure. Um, so I guess I move that the school committee appoint Sharon Grossman and Jason Err to the AHS uh, Naming and Memorial Advisory Panel. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay, that's a motion by Ms. Exton, second by Ms. Gittleson. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if we want to. Before we go any further, I'd like to invite Mr. Err to introduce himself and say hello and tell us why he'd like to serve. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jason Err. Um, by day, I'm a professor of archaeology at Harvard. Um, I have a first year student here at AHS, and I have a seventh grader at Audison. Uh, and I'm quite interested to get involved in the town. I've been lived here for 10 years. Um, this opportunity seemed to be particularly in my sweet spot because I teach a course on a uh, general education course for Harvard College students on how we know what we think we know about our past, which includes a big component about memorialization. How do we memorialize the past? Who decides, who decides what aspects of the past, who from the past gets memorialized, and how we do it? So I've been thinking a lot about this in the, in the abstract, and this is a wonderful opportunity, I think, to put it into practice, what, what the feedback I've gotten from students teaching this element over the last five years, um, in, a, in a space that uh, people in my own community will be in, and hopefully be inspired by the people who we choose to memorialize in this, in this naming process. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions from the committee? We had a great conversation with, with uh, Dr. Err and uh, Ms. Grossman, so it was, they're both, I think they're both going to add a lot to the committee. Yeah, mm -hmm. agreed. <laughs> Excellent. Are we, uh, Dr. Allison Appy? I was just going to say thank you for volunteering to serve, and Ms. Grossman also. Um, I think you both look like outstanding candidates, and that's great. We've known Ms. Grossman for a long time. She's a really highly qualified <clears throat> and dedicated volunteer in the town, so I think we've got two excellent people coming onto the committee. I'm very impressed by your credentials and very interested in, he I will be very interested in hearing your thoughts on the process and the results when we're done. When Dr. Orr came, I thought, you know, a lot of us when we're younger, we want to be archeologists because we study all that. <laughs> <laughs> he actually did it. <laughs> Most of us grow out of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you kept going. I thought, geez, it's pretty cool. Too bad we've well, already demolished the old building. You could have poked around there. Well, I, I want to talk to Jeff. I understand Jeff's involved with the building committee, yeah. and I want to find out if the contractors took drone photographs. I would love to yeah. get those transferred to the historical society. Yeah, we have so we that have, building yeah, we can have, live we have on. All that. Yeah. yeah, it's on the website. But we can. But reach out to us, and we can right. get you whatever you need. Yeah. 
Any other questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote because we're a hybrid. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And the chair votes in the affirmative, 7 0. That's a unanimous vote. Congratulations to Dr. Err and uh, Ms. Grossman, uh, who will, I'm sure will be excellent representatives of the uh, community on this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Next up uh, is the ML PAC subcommittee. So the ML PAC, the multilingual PAC, uh, is now an official entity of the school department, and they will operate in the same way as that our SPED PAC operates. So at this point, we will need to appoint a member to be the liaison to the ML PAC. Mm -hmm. I'm looking around the room for volunteers. <laughs> Seeing none, the chair is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that on if it is the wish of the rest of the committee. I so move. Second. <laughs> okay, motion by Dr. Allison Ampey, second by Ms. Gittleson. Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. That's seven, nothing, an affirmative vote. <coughs> Next stop is the proposed student trip to Costa Rica. Uh, Superintendent. I believe that Ms. Carney, our Director of World Languages, is online to share more about this and that we might have some other folks involved in the trip who can also speak to questions that the committee might have. Ms. Carney, do you want to also introduce anybody who came with you? I can only see Ms. Exton all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm unmuting. Okay. Um, yes, I'm Don Carney, the director of world languages. And I'm using two computers for the first time at home, so um, I apologize for looking not directly at everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague Heather Barber, who was a Spanish teacher at um, the high school, as well as Molly Dingley, who was another Spanish teacher at the high school. And uh, Heather is the lead on the trip, and I will. Um, uh, defer first of you to you, school committee folks. Do you have questions, or would you like to just straight up hear from Heather with a short, you know, the the, the main details? Well, let's hear your presentation first, if uh, you have one, and then we we certainly will be able to ask questions. Great. So, Heather, I'll let you unmute and take the floor. You're, Heather, you're off. Up? Your mute is not on, but we can't, or I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. No. Ms. Barber, you're, you're muted. No, she's not muted. She's trying to figure out oh, her microphone. Out. Okay. Um, if you click on the microphone and choose its source as your computer, that might help. We given her permission to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. She should be able to. Yeah, I can just say that I know Heather has permission. I know she's unmuted, and I know she's tech savvy. So something is happening that is not. <laughs> that's a little out of the ordinary. Okay, is that testing? We've got you. you go. Yes. Okay. Well, my apologies, everyone. Um, Good to see you all. Thank you so much for your patience. Heather Barber, a Spanish teacher at the high school here with Molly Dingley. Um, and Molly and I are here to request your approval of our proposed trip, uh, student trip to Costa Rica. Uh, we are 
proposing a nine day trip to Costa Rica next February break, um, February 15th through 23rd, 2025. Um, we're looking to bring um, upwards of about 25 Spanish students uh, on a cultural language, language and uh, sustainability focused trip. Um, we will be flying into San Jose, Costa Rica um, and doing sort of a loop around the north down into uh, the Pacific coast and then back out of San Jose. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly excited about this opportunity because I used to live in Costa Rica. I lived there for two years and I'm really excited to share a country that I know very well and love with our students. Uh, we'll be doing this trip with the American Council for International Studies, the IS. Uh, you have information about them uh, in your packet, as well as all the details about our itinerary. Um, yes, well, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that we've just been having such success with the department trips. You've heard about, um, there was a recent article uh, written in uh, the, the AHS, and I guess the um, department's newsletter about the success of the Quebec and the um, Taiwan trips. We're really looking to capitalize on that success and to really have these trips be a part of our um, world language department for the future. I'm happy to answer questions, happy to uh, give you more details as needed. And Heather, I'd just like to add that um, you also planned for, I believe, two nights of homestay. We're planning two nights of homestay to really focus on the linguistic portion of the trip. Um, that was a real highlight of the Taiwan trip. And we really wanted to just provide the students with that um, intense language opportunity with families in Costa Rica. So we'd be um, the second day, we would be heading up to a place called Sarifiki and students would be two to a family mm -hmm. and staying with the family for two nights and doing some work in the farms and speaking exclusively in Spanish, which is an exciting part of the trip. Does this conclude your presentation? Happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions from the committee. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Um, so I have a comment and a question. So my comment is I, I appreciate that this obvious, I did check the 2425 calendar and it looks like you've done a nice job of like threading this right within, it's a long trip, um, but, but there won't be missing school, which I think is important for students. Um, also, as a parent of two Spanish students at Arlington High School, who we cannot afford to send on a $4,000 trip, we cannot afford to send two of them. I'm grateful that at least their teachers will be in Arlington to teach them Spanish, given that we cannot send them to Costa Rica to learn Spanish. So I'm glad that it's during the break. Um, I think that's that's good. Um, the question that I had was um, around, I read the behavior contract that's in the packet, which seems fine. I think it's, I, I think we maybe use this behavior contract for a lot of our AHS trips. My question is, is if there was a student with a behavioral issue during the trip, what would happen with or to them and what messaging would be given to their families? Thanks for the question. Um, well, first, we'll talk about a little bit of prevention. Um, in addition to the behavior contract, um, Molly and I have created a recommendation form, and each student who is applying to go on the trip will need to um, receive recommendations from both a language teacher and a non-language teacher. And we've addressed questions um, around specifically their community mindedness. Um, so that is something that we're focusing on ahead of time as a preventive effort. Um, and certainly in terms of challenges while we're on the trip, um, certainly we have, we're traveling with teenagers. We've traveled with teenagers before. Um, and I anticipate, I don't anticipate problems, but if there are, um, you know, I, we certainly have the option to send a student home. That would be the last resort. Um, our expectation um, would be to work with students in the same way we work with them every single day. Um, and to make them feel supported, to have them understand their decision making and take responsibility for their decision making. So, Molly, so if you were going to send them home, what would that look like? Like you just put them on a like. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not. This, this is something that has come up on trips in APS before. So it's not sort of 
Um, no. So I guess I'm curious, like, what what do you do? Do you send them home by themselves? Like, does somebody go with them? What does that I'd look like? like? To the question you actually. can speak to that as well, too. So yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, just because as um, the, I participated in the Taiwan trip this year, so I was very involved in understanding all of the details as a chaperone for my first high school trip at um, in my time at AHS. And I talked very specifically with Dr. Jenger about this. And it is very explicit in the behavior policy about um, school behaviors and what is a, 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 an offense at school is an offense um, when one is traveling uh, in addition to the laws of that country. And I was very specific, um, again, with Matthew to build. I wanted to build my own understanding, to have a deep understanding of this, to be able to talk to students about it. Um, as a chaperone before we went to Taiwan and then while we were there. And for egregious events, such as drug or alcohol use, um, though I, I, my understanding is the way the contract is written is, yes, everybody understands that students would need to be, would need to go home. That is an, an offense at school and that would uh, violate the contract of the behavior contract for the trip in order to manage the ratio of students and chaperones we can't have chaperones take a student home so we talk to families also about um making sure their passports are current in case there was an emergency and they needed to come get retrieve their child okay so this policy is not in there's a different policy on this that's not in our because the policy that the behavior contract that we were given in the packet is very like light touch, right? It's sort of like the food might be weird and you might be delayed and inconvenienced. Um, so don't be a jerk, um, which is great, right? Like we definitely don't want them to be to do that. But but where is all of this spelled out about like if your kid drinks alcohol in Costa Rica, you might need to fly down and pick them up. Like where does it say where where is that? I have to admit that I don't have the documents open right in front of me. So I would um, A, double check where we have this explicitly stated. I know that we have it stated um, that it's it's part of parent conversation, uh, parent meetings um, about the responsibilities for the trip. And we talk to the students about very specifically what is um, the student, you know, respecting the rules of the student handbook. So I think I need to get back to you on that. So I am looking at the behavior contract. It explicitly states what the expectations are. It does not explicitly state what the repercussions are in the event that the behavior contract is violated. So I do think it would be better if the contract had that in it. I don't know where you are with getting people's signatures on this. I can take back to Dr. Janger that when we do our work to lay out what the trip options are at AHS next year, that this should be more explicit about what happens in the event that these agreements are not abided by. And Ms. Carney, if that's something that we can go revise for this trip ahead of everyone signing it, then that would be great. And I could certainly report back to the committee um, where that stands once I have a chance to talk to Dr. Janker and Ms. Carney. Thank you. Uh, is it possible so, to run this by council? Legal council, yes. Yeah, given, yeah. I mean, yeah. we run our permission trip for permission slip for I field trips. I mean, when trips we take the them, kids so. down to like the Gibbs, yeah. we have a permission. So, that, I mean, I, I really like the. I like the feel of this. I think there's a lot to like in here. I think it's accessible. I think there's not a lot of legalese, but um, I don't I, want to assume it hasn't also gone by council already. Once, maybe it has. But I can talk to her about what would make sense to. It just it feels like there should be like a consistent behavior contract that we use here that is really clear with families about what happens if their kids do X, Y, or Z and what the expectations are for them and that it's written down and it's not just part of a conversation that we have with them so that there's something everybody can refer back to and say, okay, if this happens, then this happens. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, I think it's part of us as a district protecting our staff who we are sending far away to do work on behalf of our students and um, 
there should be something where it's really explicit and clear about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Thank you. Dr. I, I, Happy. Sorry, I'm Molly Digley. I'm the other Spanish teacher that will be, if if we are granted the ability to take the students to Costa Rica, I will be going on a trip with Heather. Uh, but I just wanted to say that I have taken, so when I was younger, but I was 25, I took 20, 22 kids, my, myself and just one other gentleman to Spain. And we did have to send four kids home for drinking and two kids for like sexual contact. And there was a very specific procedure, but it was very clear to parents that like they knew prior, like if your child drinks, and your child does this A, B, C, they will get sent home. And so um, my coworker stayed with, like they were, for example, we were in um, court, we were in Cordoba when the incident happened and the airport is Madrid. So I stayed with the four, or the, the, we just decided who's gonna be better to navigate the system and to like figure out what to do. So I took the four kids that were going home while my co-leader um, was responsible for the other 18 kids, which I know would not, it's like too many, we would have more chaperones anyway, if we were on an AHS trip, but we had like really strict procedures on how to even like interview the kids to make sure we understand who was drinking. And then we had a really strict procedure as to how to put them on the plane and like what to do. And the parents knew when they got those emails and when I had to talk to each parent over the phone that at the end of the day, it was like the kid, the kid, like you can't look at any other child because your kid made this decision. So we're just looking at your kid, your kid has made this decision. And so because your kid made this decision, this is what it says. Sorry, your child has to go home for safety purposes. And then we ended up having no repercussions for many of the parents. So I just want to say that I do have like very explicit training on how to send the kid home. And also like we had how to interview kids, a lot of different training. So I'm happy to also, if, if it's not super explicit across the board for these trips, I'm also ha happy to to help because I've had the experience having to do the different stuff. <laughs> so. Thank you, Dr. Allison Ampey. Hi, thank you. Um, so when we had the trip to Italy coming through, I had asked about COVID quarantine because in Italy there was still, at least the most recent, I, information suggested if someone tested positive for COVID that they may still be quarantined for a while. I don't know what's going on with Costa Rica, but given other things that are going on in the world, my questions would be, if there is a significant illness, um, do you, will you have the staffing to be able to have someone stay with that student um, until things can be worked out? And second, um, it looks like Costa Rica has a number of vaccinations that are required and I didn't see anywhere <coughs> or, or they're suggested by the CDC and I didn't see anywhere any discussion about that sort of stuff. I may have missed it, um, but just if that's being brought up to families or at least having them suggest, a, I mean, suggesting that they talk to their doctors uh, for recommendations. I can take that. And um, with regards to vaccinations, um, the places in Costa Rica that those vaccinations are suggested, not required, but suggested, are not places that we will be visiting. Okay. Um, so that's why that wasn't um, approached in the documents. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I just have a question about timing. We're, when do you need this a decision made so you can start planning? We were hoping to be able to announce this to students before the end of the year where <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of time on that front, but we were hoping for people to be able to start planning and thinking about this over the summer. Sometimes that will, you know, uh, mean that a student decides they want to get a summer job to support it or just just giving a little more flexibility in terms of um, doing some fundraising uh, because I share the committee's concern around price and um, you know our focus really uh, is on equity and trying to make sure that students who think that this is out of the question for them are encouraged to come and hear about this as an opportunity and, and 
um, learn about scholarships and learn about fundraising. So that's a long way of saying as soon as possible, because we were certainly hoping to be able to talk about it, uh, share this with our students um, before the end of the school year. So I have a question. Are we are we are we meeting again in this month or? Um... Uh, uh, at, at this point, it looks like we will need one more meeting, so we're not going to get rid of the meeting on the 20th. Now, I don't know right. how much is going to end up on the agenda, but uh, uh, Dr. Is, Coleman. That's not before the end of the school year, though. Yeah, so is there a way, I'm just wondering if there would be interest um, in approving this contingent upon uh, the teaching staff getting the documentation uh, approved by Dr. Holman? That would be an appropriate motion, if you'd like to make it. I move that we approve the trip contingent upon the teaching, the, the staff uh, getting uh, the appropriate documentation mentioned this evening to Dr. Homan. And I'm looking for a second. Second, second by Dr. Allison <coughs> Ampey. So the motion is by Mr. Thielman, seconded <coughs> by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Is Ms. Exton with us? I think she has to leave at seven. Okay, yeah, she had to uh, leave the meeting. Uh, Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. That's a six nothing vote. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for all the work you're doing for our students. Uh, next up is the second read and possible vote for policies ACA, BGB, BDD, IHBB, and the zero emission vehicle policy, Mr. Carden. Um, we reviewed the policies last time. I don't think I got any, I did not get any <laughs> requested changes or feedback, so I think we're ready to Approve? Do you want me to uh, approve, move approval for all four or uh, five? five sorry. All five. All five, or do you want to vote? You can, uh, unless there is a reason to divide it, uh, move approval for all five. I move approval of file of the changes or new policies file ACA, BGB, DDD, IHBB, and ZEV. With a note that the ZEV will not be the file name when we encode it in the book. No, it's the file name. I'm just modifying your, your EZEV policy. Okay, so that uh, that's oh, that's just an amendment to the EZ yes. policy. So that would be uh, uh, EV, EV. What's the, the name of the policy? That would ECEV. Be ECEV as amended. Yes, that's right. It's correct in the in the attachment. ECEV. Yes. So on the motion to. Approve uh, changes to ACA, BGB, BDD, IHBB, and ECEV. Uh, motion by Mr. Cardin, second by Mr. Thielman. Mr. Thielman. Sure. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative, 6 nothing. Uh, unanimous vote. Thank Can I you. ask a question about this? Go right ahead. Um, so what is the expectation? So like the IHBB has a requirement that child find be posted prominently on the website. Um, what's the expectation on like turnaround time for that? I know that like we did a resolution last June that last I checked wasn't on the website. Maybe it's there now. It's been a while. So I would guess it's got to be less than a year, right? Yeah. Well, so, I sent it out immediately after that resolution was passed. Which... Right. The resolution though specifically said it had to be posted on the website, which is why I'm asking about this one, which says specifically that it's prominently on the website. So I'm just curious what would be a reasonable expectation of timeline for when that would happen? Okay, so um, we can look at it tomorrow and figure out what. Well, I mean, I don't think tomorrow is necessary, but it's currently posted on the special ed page. Yeah, the child find notice is on the special ed page. It was on the front page of the old website. It. I'm not sure about exactly how to get it on the front page of the new website, but I was going to explore that. 
Um, but maybe by the start of school in September. Is that reasonable? Absolutely. It right. is on the website now, so I just want to emphasize that. It is on the website, but okay. it's on the special ed page, and that's not where it belongs because this is not a special ed policy. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a overarching policy, so we need to move it. Um, so I'll talk to Ms. Pierre about that. It will absolutely be posted by the start of the school year, and Great. I will be informing everyone of this policy shift um, in the staff newsletter that's going out at the end of this week. Great. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, after school programming report policy KFD, Dr. Homan. Okay. Did we vote on the policies this time? Did, oh, we didn't vote on the policy? Yes, we did. We voted. They vote? Yes, and then voted Jane asked that. her question after we voted. Oh, okay. 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 That's Both Kirsten and I. Yeah. You know, yes. that's, that's why I was confused. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we good? Mm hmm. Okay. Um, so, thank you, Mr. Schlickman. I am uh, pleased to report about after school programs in the 2023 24 school year, as well as um, some next steps that we're planning on taking. I'm going to start with an overview of enrollment for our vendor partners and then talk about enrollment in our AASP programs. I'm going to look back at 22 23 and then at this year's enrollment. I'm happy to answer any questions about enrollment when we're done. Um, as well as finances. So uh, our vendor partners in 2022-23 had the following enrollments and wait lists, um, averaging around 157 students enrolled in each program um, and about 43 students who remained on the wait list at the end of last year. This school year, our vendor partners had an increase in enrollment overall with an average of about 166 students per each program. Um, a reduction in reported wait list, but I think some of that could have to do also with the time of year we were asking wait list numbers move around. Sometimes the programs, including uh, actually ASP keeps theirs alive because I ask for them to. Um, but as programs verify that families have received something else, come up with something else or don't want a spot, they'll sometimes sweep the wait list mid year. Um, so I think that that number might be a little bit deceiving in terms of families that maybe wanted to be in a program but didn't actually get access to one. Um, notably, Bishop's enrollment was significantly increased this year, uh, and Dallin had been working on uh, increasing capacity as well. These are our AASP programs. I've adjusted how I'm calculating the average a little bit for this year because it occurred to me that we were including Bracket, which also has another program that's sort of the standard program in the school and the enrollment in the bracket program is uh, for a small and specialized dual language program that's very high demand. We love that we have the program. We're looking to have more opportunities like that um, in the schools, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but I didn't want to include that in the average because it can skew it a bit since those numbers are lower and are meant to be lower. And so the average is capturing Hardy Pierce Thompson enrollment. Um, and our enrollment this year, or last school year, 2022-23, I adjusted that as well just so you would have the point of comparison. So last year, um, the average was around 140 with an average of about 40 students on the wait lists at any given school, the highest wait lists being at Hardy and Thompson where our demand is the greatest. This year we improved slightly but not as much as we would like um, with 143 students average in each program. We did increase uh, enrollment at Thompson, not so much at Hardy, but we still have a significant and larger wait list at both schools with an average wait list of 46 students. And like I said, we don't sweep the wait lists for AASP at all. We keep it uh, steady. We were able to accept more students into the bracket program, which is great. We also saw a decrease in enrollment in BASP this year, the bracket program. Um, and we didn't have as many students on the wait list in the bracket AASP program. So I wanted to start demonstrating some enrollment trends. Uh, I've only been collecting this data in this way for a few years now, but now we have three years of comparison data, so it's a little more useful to create a trend line. Um, we're seeing that, like I just said, the bracket after school program, which is one of our vendor partners enrollment, significantly reduced in 2024. We saw an increase to the AASP bracket program, like I said, um, so it's possible there was a bit of offset there. Um, our Bright Star enrollment significantly increased at, um, shoot, I'm forgetting which, oh, at Bishop, yes, at Bishop, like I said a moment ago. Um, and then all the others are stable to slightly growing, um, I would say relatively stable. And so we'd like to see those numbers start to increase. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
this is a similar depiction to what we had shown in previous years. Uh, like I said, we're missing some data. It's either missing or not shared by our vendor partners because it had been swept. Um, Waitlist information can vary throughout the school year. We do have uh, vendors throughout the community who rely on students coming to them for after school care as well. Uh, we know that everybody's first choice is often for the student to remain at the school where they are. Um, and we have a lot of uh, organizations that also provide aftercare programming to our students and provide transportation in some cases from our schools to their programs and so um, a lot of families that had been on wait lists had either chosen to go to one of those places worked out another plan or done or taken some combination of days at each of the schools I did find this year also in collecting the data that some of the after school programs were reporting overall like the number of students that they have in a program others were reporting the number of students they could take in a day as their enrollment in the program because on any given day they have a different enrollment so one of the things I'd like to work with Mr. Gorski on when he comes next year is how we capture both um, both the full number of families that have gotten some degree of aftercare as well as the number of families who have gotten the extent of aftercare that they were looking for because those, are, those could be two very different things and it's easy to make it maybe look as though our enrollment's really high when in fact we have a lot of folks who don't quite have what they need but they've been making it work with what they got. Um, and so uh, we haven't di divvied out the data that way before and doing so will probably be complicated um, but I do think if we wanna get a really accurate picture we're gonna have to get a little more granular about it. Um, I've collected some financial information from the after school programs. This picture is showing our revenue from last year, our, the final um, numbers for revenue for last year and expenditures. Salaries are grouped. The directors do provide their, their explicit salary as well as all the salaries of their staff separately to me as per the policy. It's represented here um, in aggregate for the committee and the projected expenses at end of year this year once they close out the books for this year. A few things that we're thinking about and planning for for next school year. One is a new Chinese language and culture after school program at the Stratton. Um, they will have one classroom. They do have families from all over Arlington transporting their students to this program. Um, and it will be a relatively small program to start out next school year, but we're excited to welcome it into the Stratton School and to have some students participate in that. We're currently in the process of developing the rental agreements for 2024-25. I'm working with Ms. Pierre um, to develop those and to make sure that all of the needed costs are in there. Uh, it, this year's will include a utilities fee, so we're trying to work out how to calculate that. Uh, we had let everybody know that that was coming last year and it has not been a part of the rental agreements in the past, so we just want to make sure that it's a, an appropriate um, fee, but we are keeping power and everything else on in the schools through the evening, and so that's one of the parts of the expenses that the school department takes on when we keep our schools open to that many kids at the end of the day. Hiring is conti has continued to be a challenge throughout the school year. It's not nearly as significant as it was last year. All, pro all of the programs, if you look at their um, financials, have raised salaries to compensate for somewhat difficult hiring pools. We've approved a lot of salary increases for staff uh, for AASP throughout the year to try to make it more competitive with some of our other roles that are similar in terms of how they are compensated. Uh, we have continued a program that allows our AASP folks to also work in the school as a TA in Unit D for like a partial uh, FTE because that gives them a more full-time schedule. Um, and since we do pay benefits for these folks, uh, it's useful to us to be adding a little bit to their salary and also have a little bit of additional support in the school. So that has helped with retention a little bit. We're gonna keep that uh, program going. Our goal is to increase our AASP enrollment average to match vendor partner averages in 24, 25, um, with a particular focus on the schools with the largest wait lists, which are Hardy and Thompson. And so I'm really hoping that that average, when we get it from our vendor partners next year and the average for ASP at the very least match, um, if not, we have our internal program outpacing our partners. This was a articulated goal and expectation as well for this year. We had some issues with hiring that, um, I, as I understand it, created barriers for initial enrollment of students. And I'm working with Todd Morse to 
alleviate those issues and plan for more students for next school year. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions from the community? Ms. Morgan. Um, so I've, I've expressed this privately. The, the Bishop numbers are, mm -hmm. are concerning to me. Um, the amount of movement, the amount of uh, effort it is required of our staff to collect those numbers um, I, I don't appreciate. Um, we provide them a um, competitive ability to operate their business in our school buildings and exclusive access to our kids and families and they need to uh, comply and participate in the expectations that we have for them. There is no way that their revenue was $900,000 even and that they spent exactly $900,000. Like it's just not like just math doesn't work that way. It's never that neat. So um, the bracket after school looks pretty good. Uh, the Dallin numbers, there's also no way they spent exactly $786,991, nor did they spend 673,144 last year. It's just like not possible unless they were buying popsicles down to the like five popsicles on the last day. So um, it feels like there's, we can once, you know, I also don't think this is the job of the superintendent mm -hmm. <laughs> either. <laughs> so when we have somebody in the position to follow up on this, I, my expectation is, is that we will get far better uh, responsiveness from them and better numbers because these, um, this to me, it, it, it's just, I feel pretty good about the AASP numbers because those would be in our budget book, but the rest of it, um, I I can't even, I, yeah, yikes. Um, so that's the question that I had though about the AASP programs, why are we able to enroll? So as a percentage of the school population, why are we able to enroll so many kids at Pierce as a percentage of how many kids go there? And yet we can't get uh, like what what what's going on at Hardy and Thompson such that we're not able to get like is it adult humans do they not want to work there like what's the do you have any sense of why I think that the and the so I've asked this question it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, the sense that I have gotten is that space is one of the critical issues. And I know that, in fact, it is because I have, we have had the discussion with principals on repeat around the conditions surrounding having a teacher knowing that they're, like, from the moment they are done with their school day, you need to vacate and you're going to come back into your classroom and things may or may not be where you left them. Um, and that's hard because you walk in in the morning, you've dropped your kids off, you have exactly five seconds to basically get the room back into whatever state it was in. And so it can be, while our teachers completely understand that these are town buildings, these are town resource, we need to provide after school care, they care about their kids, they want the families to have what they need. So I'm not at all faulting teachers for the challenge that comes along with sharing a classroom. So we do try to rotate that. And the buildings have one gym, one cafeteria, one library, and all of those larger spaces are used all the way throughout the use of that, that after school time, along with a number of classrooms. And to expand the number of classrooms out means that you're expanding the number of teachers whose classrooms you're using at the end of the day. And when we try to keep that rotation going, that means we're trying to get let people cycle off so that you don't have to worry about that as much because it does change the dynamics of when you get to work, it changes the dynamics of when you leave work, and it changes how much work you're taking home if you don't have that space for an hour after school to kind of get it ready, prep for the next day. So that is one limitation, and I've been working with the principals on that at length to sort of figure out what feels like a reasonable number of classrooms for AASP to be taking over. On Wednesdays, space is a really big issue because on Wednesdays, they're all still there while after school's going on, and there are meeting spaces that need to be accessed um, there are a lot of meeting spaces that need to be accessed. Often the teachers are taking one of the larger spaces that the AASP program is utilizing. Now, all of that said, our vendor partners managed to make this work with more students in the program with all of that, all of those factors still, still at play. 
Sure. I guess, so I guess the point I would make <laughs> is that Hardy and Thompson also have more teachers at them because yes. they are far larger schools. More classrooms. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to shift things across multiple teachers, when you have more teachers, you come up less. Like, that's... That's why it's hard for me to see that we have 131 kids at Pierce and 134 kids at Hardy. We have a lot more teachers at Hardy. We have a lot more physical boxes there mm -hmm. than we do at Pierce. So it feels like the expectations, while I appreciate the challenges, there needs to be some consistency of expectation across schools because if if your participate, if your classroom is being utilized at Pierce once every, you know, I'm making this up once every 10 days, but if you're at Hardy, it's once every 15 days. Like that doesn't, I know it's not that simple, but it, there's, there are a lot more people to absorb the impact at Hardy than there are at Pierce. I so. think it's a combination of space and programmatic design. And if the programmatic design is more flexible, then we can achieve higher numbers. So we're going but to But these are both that. our programs. Yes, I understand. The, the, the way classes are divvied, the schedule is developed, and the teachers are allocated at all of the programs in AASP is similar. Okay. So I may need to look different at Hardy and Thompson in order for, because we have more demand, and that requires a difference in staffing model. But because the staffing model is the same in all the programs for ASP, it creates some inflexibility. I'm happy to. Okay. So you send the same number of humans to each of these? No, no, no. The, the, the design of the schedule for the day, the afternoon. Okay. The, the sort of. Yeah, so when they're, when they're in the big spaces, right, mm -hmm. there's like 50 kids in the gym with, you know, an appropriate ratio of teachers. But then if you're dividing that up, if you have another 50 kids you want to expand capacity for, and you're dividing that up to four different classrooms or three different mm -hmm. classrooms, it's a different staffing model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm just, my recollection is that part of the contract or part of our policy is that the programs are supposed to be supplying us with the information about wait lists and salaries yes. and things like that. And so perhaps as, I'd, I don't remember if it's in the contract or if it's in policy, but either one, mm. perhaps we need to <coughs> add some teeth to it in terms of fines or something if they're not supplying accurate and timely information. Mr. Card. Thanks. Um, so thank you for, for wrestling down all this information and getting it to us. It, it, um, I mean, it, we, we said six years ago that this was an important mm -hmm. issue, um, and that's why we, we passed the policy to collect the data. And the purpose of collecting the data was not because we had a lot of data. It was to, just to track to whether we were making progress on addressing this issue. And basically it shows that sort of we're really benefiting from the enrollment decrease, not really from increasing capacity. But with the enrollment decrease and with the ability to increase capacity just a little bit more, like they've managed to do somehow at Bishop, um, we're close. So I would encourage you again to, it's in the strategic plan. These principals, particularly at Hardy and Thompson, need to take ownership of this as an issue and work with Todd to figure out a solution. I mean, it shouldn't be you sitting down, you know, spending hours <laughs> figuring out which teacher goes where. Um, it, it really, you know, has to be in their plan to, to, to move the needle a little bit, and hopefully next year when we come back, we'll see very, very low wait lists. Thanks. Anyone else? Let, I, me, let me ask a question, then I'll recognize you, mm -hmm. unless you... I had one more thing to share okay, go that ahead. I had meant to put in the presentation and completely forgot. One of the things that uh, Mr. Morse and I are working on is a plan for providing for scholarships for students who might need them for after school programming. We do this sort of on an as needed basis already, but we'd like a more formal sort of procedure for uh, when a family or a student could really benefit from the additional support 
in after school. So that's something that we're working on as well for next year. It doesn't really fix enrollment challenges, but it does make aftercare a little more accessible to families who really need it or students who benefit from it. Sorry, go ahead. My, my question is, if we have a, a private vendor who is not cooperative, uh, what are our options in terms of terminating a relationship? So I think, first of all, while it, some of the challenge to getting data together this year is not entirely the fault of our partners mm -hmm. um, in the schools, insofar as we've done this with the survey in the past, I have sent them the survey now, we did not have the survey together by the time we needed to do this presentation, mm -hmm. and so we went about getting the information in a way that was perhaps less organized in the last mm -hmm. few years. Um, we have heard from partners concern about sharing this information publicly. We have shared in response all of the things Mr. Cardin just said mm -hmm. and emphasized that there is a policy associated with this and that lack of compliance with the policy could have repercussions that would be discussed by the school committee. Um, so we are getting the information in. I think there are other measures we can take. One of the things I want to talk to Mr. Gorski about is getting the tax returns for our, the program so that we can cross-check um, the financials because that has to be reported. Um, so we have other means for gathering reported information and ensuring that the information that we're gathering is correct. Uh, so I just don't know what all that entails and would need Mr. Gorski's help to, to do some of that. I think I can um, convey back to them the importance of and the, the discussion and some of the things that came up as priorities and the importance of making sure that we get these data in a timely manner in future years while also sharing with them my appreciation for their patience as we sort of went back and forth and made sure that everything looked right and landed in the correct spreadsheet correctly. Um, and I, I think there was good faith on folks' parts to try to re be responsive and um, just we had a few that needed cross-checked several times. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, under this agenda item? Seeing none, there's no action to be taken here. We go to uh, second read of district goals for 23-24. Dr. Holman. Okay. I'm going to share the document. I had every intention of putting this into some slides for today. Um, that did not manage to happen, so I just want to walk through some of the major um, points that we're hoping to hit on for next year. Uh, and priorities that I think would be important for the public and the community to know that we're looking forward to working on for next year. So uh, when it comes to core instruction and instructional vision, we're really focusing next year on uh, deeper learning, what we believe that means, what high quality core instruction in the classroom is and what it looks like uh, developing look for, spending a lot of time with adults, um, highlighting excellent practice where it's already happening in the district, highlighting what our expectations are, for excellent practice um, and what those moves are and really uh, having sort of a group focus on that. Of course, linked to that is our rollout of a new elementary ELA curriculum that is aligned with deeper learning, so we don't want that to feel like an extra thing, like deeper learning is an extra thing on top of the ELA rollout. Um, we really are hoping to dig in on the performance tasks at the end of each unit of EL education because that's where deeper learning opportunities live and the work you do throughout the unit to build up to those performance tasks, build the foundation for doing some of that deeper learning. So we're looking forward to thinking about all of that next year along with considering the uh, future of leveling practices at the secondary level, particularly in middle school mathematics and in ninth grade at Arlington High School. In student belonging and adult support, we're launching the DEIBJ Community Task Force next year. We're hoping that that group will have uh, connections with climate and culture committees at each school and those climate and culture committees at each school will be helped out by the fact that we do have a new committee structure in our bargaining agreement that allows and asks for educators to join a committee at their school. And one of those committees will be explicitly focused on uh, equity and inclusion, hopefully have a lot of opportunities to collaborate with the ILT so that we're seeing that in instruction, but also in all other aspects of the school experience. Um, in MTSS, we have a number of things we'll be doing and we'll be creating separate task forces for a few of these. So one is to revise our district accommodation plan so that it is a useful tool for our teachers 
to look at and consider what their options are when they're having some challenges in the classroom or with a particular student um, and gives them options for differentiating instruction, for engaging students in multiple modes, um, for designing lesson plans. We'll have uh, another group focused on developing student support team protocols for all schools and making sure that the uh, cycles and process for student support teams are consistent throughout the district, something we discussed at CIAA meeting earlier this year. Um, and we will have a task force continue that started this year um, and had only really gotten into a couple of meetings, but that is looking forward to starting back up next year that is focused on chronic absenteeism and intervention programs for addressing student absenteeism. In valuing all staff, uh, we will be continuing our focus on representation and retention for APS staff on improving our measurement capacity when it comes to tracking retention and uh, on implementing some of the stuff that we had developed this year surrounding mentoring, onboarding, and induction, particularly newly developed this year for paraprofessionals and administrators, but we're also taking a look at our mentor program to make sure that it is operating the way we want it to and giving teachers a great onboarding experience as well. Um, we're hoping to get some pathway courses or programs t uh, started at AHS for students who are interested in education as a profession um, and expanding some of our partnerships and internship opportunities for our students. In professional development, um, we will be focusing on uh, implementing peer observation protocols, particularly to support, to support the EL education adoption, um, and we'll be doing some, mild, some like minor adjustments to our professional learning approach on the early release days to have still some choice embedded for teachers in terms of what they're doing, but also some uh, empowerment of our ILTs, our instructional leadership teams, to guide the learning of uh, professionals in, during their professional release time. Um, in competitive compensation, we are going to competitively compensate people, mm -hmm. which is very exciting, and we're going to implement the terms of those new collective bargaining agreements, which is also very exciting. So we'll focus on that next year. Um, in 3.1, we're going to be focused on making sure that we complete phase three and start phase four of the Arlington High School building project. Uh, we'll be starting our work on a statement of interest for the Audison Middle School and making sure that we have a plan for instructional technology and building spaces that are inclusive for all students, as well as developing our capital and design needs for our schools and implementing those. Um, we'll be looking at developing more culturally responsive menus for our students and including healthy lunch and breakfast options and continuing to focus on bringing our breakfast numbers up. They are up significantly this year um, and I'll share some of that data the next time we meet. And in facility stewardship, we're going to be working with the town to make sure that we're implementing improvement plans for buildings that are aligned with the town's net zero action plan, um, continuing to develop sustainability options at all of our schools and implementing a consistent procedure for reporting facilities needs, which is something I'm working right now with the facilities director for the town on <coughs> so that folks know where to go when they're having a facilities issue. In strategic priority four, sustaining collaborative partnerships, we're going to do what we talked about tonight, which is continuing to work on decreasing the number of families who are on waiting lists for after school care. Um, keep providing more extracurricular opportunities for students. At some point, we should bring a report to the committee on all of the amazing extracurriculars that became available over the last couple of years because we had all kinds of after school courses and clubs and um, exciting opportunities for students from elementary through high school. Uh, that were generated this year and got a lot of interest from our students. We'll be devel developing a strategy for secondary overnight experiences and travel and thinking through opportunities for um, subsidization of extracurricular programming for students who are having trouble accessing it. Uh, in Welcome Center and Registration, we're going to keep focusing on bringing PTOs together, on expanding our family university and forum offerings, and on developing partnerships with our town agencies to make sure that those resources that are available in the town are easily visible and accessible for our families. And then in Communication and Partnership, we're going to do a very sharp focus on the APS website next year, calendars and district-facing communications to make sure they're easy to use and navigate. Um, we're going to develop some protocols for our staff um, that will help uh, them develop communications that are consistent in their sort of messaging and format, both student-facing, family-facing, 
um, and staff facing, and then we'll be rolling out also some two-way communication technologies um, that actually use School Messenger to create sort of more of a chat format uh, where we need it for families that we're going back and forth with a little bit so we don't have to rely so much on email correspondence. And those are the, you know, just a few things that we're hoping to do next year. Is that all? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> very, very extensive list. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move approval of the 2024-25 uh, district goals and objectives. And a second. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Gittleson. Any discussion or questions? Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you. This is, I, I like how you've changed this. Uh, one question I had is for the um, establishing a culture, climate and culture committee at each school to conduct empathy interviews. I'm, I mean, and I know it does other things. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering are these empathy interviews, are they gonna be used to compare school experience, experiences at different schools to each other? And my concern is about the consistency of mm -hmm. the interviews. If you have different committees and different people doing them at each oh, school. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It, yep. it's, so. so generally empathy interviews as practice are in designed to help you more deeply understand a challenge you've already identified in quantitative data. So if, for example, we're at Bracket and they're saying the focal group we really want to zoom in on this year and better understand their experiences of um, are our students with IEPs, then they might, the Climate and Culture Committee in partnership with the ILT might just say we're going to do some empathy interviews with our students who have IEPs and talk to them about what they're challenged by, have them share stories about like what's really working for them at school. Um, what is challenging for them at school. We don't take that data and compare it across schools, okay. but what we do do, to, to your point about consistency, that's a really good question, is that we have um, training on how to conduct an empathy interview and that we do with any team that's gonna go and do these. And uh, the DEIBJ department does these trainings and in the training they experience an empathy interview, they practice conducting one, they talked about the they talk about the different kinds of questions because one of the <coughs> role one of the roles of an empathy interview is to get somebody telling their stories. It's very much not to ask leading questions. So they talk about what a leading question is, what a question is that gets you know that elicits stories and spe specifics from folks, um, and they're very confidential spaces. So the notes that are taken um, are relatively sparse. Usually, they're not like we might grab a couple of quotes from the student, uh, but we're very explicit with them that the purpose of this is for us to better understand what it's like to be in your shoes, mm -hmm. um, not for us to take it and do comparisons across. But we do have that like process that teams have to go through before they can ever do these. Um, they have to go through that training. With okay, the great. That relieves my concerns. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Um, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. It's a six nothing <coughs> vote. Uh, the uh, motion is approved. Superintendent's update. All right. I would like to begin by saying congratulations to the class of 2024. Um, on the screen is my favorite moment of the year when the caps go up in the air. Uh, we had an amazing graduating class this year and a really beautiful graduation ceremony. Uh, we heard about all of the incredible accomplishments that this class is engaged in. This has been a class that has been through a completely different experience every single year that they were at Arlington High School. Um, from entering during remote, or yeah, entering during remote learning, um, to moving into multiple phases of a building project. Uh, this group has been the most ad adaptive, I would say, mm -hmm. um, in recent history, and has also been quite the advocacy group. Like, they have done a lot of work to improve their community. Um, they've taken on a lot of projects that have had a pretty, really significant impact on AHS, and they'll have a legacy that, that you know, 
lasts beyond them uh, walking across that stage. So congratulations to the class of 2024. It was wonderful to celebrate each of you the other day, and we wish you the best in your next adventure. I also want to say congratulations to the lab class of 2024. They will graduate tomorrow. Um, as a reminder, lab is a collaborative that we are a member of and that I sit on the board of, a special education collaborative with programs um, in the uh, partner schools of Lexington, Arlington, Burlington, Bedford, Belmont, and now Watertown. Um, and so they will all graduate tomorrow and we're looking forward to celebrating them as well as members of our Arlington community. Uh, we had Metco Field Day today. Uh, that The picture on the lower right is a picture of our Metco students who stuck around um, and had a wonderful field day. They played outside a number of games, celebrated the end of the school year, and they had some beautiful weather uh, in order to do that, which was great for them. Arlington was also awarded to, this was new in the update, uh, I just added this a few minutes ago. Um, we were awarded a $200,000 uh, grant for another electric school bus through the EPA Clean School Bus Rebate Program, and we just learned about that earlier this week, so we'll be celebrating that and working on decommissioning one of our fuel-powered buses and purchasing another electric school bus, so I'll keep the committee updated on that as we look forward to welcoming that bus into our fleet. Um, related to that topic, we're also speaking with the town about our options for building out Arlington infrastructure to plug these things in, mm -hmm. because right now one of our limitations for applying mm -hmm. for these grants mm -hmm. that other communities aren't experiencing to the same degree is that we don't have as many plugs, and we have to do all the wiring and infrastructure development in order to plug these in. So what we'll be doing with this bus is rotating it out through the other the plugs we have um, currently, and we'll have to work out a system for that. Uh, and I'm speak, speaking with folks on the town side about what we can do to plan for our uh, investing later in additional infrastructure that would allow us to purchase more electric school buses in the future. Um, a few updates on administrative hiring searches. Uh, as the community knows, we announced on Monday that Rochelle Rubino, who was previously an assistant principal at Audison Middle School, will be welcoming her back as the principal at Audison Middle School. Uh, Mr. Maringer informed of us of his resignation a couple of weeks ago, and we're thrilled that Ms. Rubino accepted our offer to come back and serve as OMS principal. Um, she knows the community. She's a very innovative leader um, and visionary. She's an excellent communicator, and we're very um, excited to have her coming back to Arlington Public School. She's been a principal at uh, in Reading for the last couple of years since leaving Arlington. We've also completed the Pierce assistant principal search and want to welcome Lizbeth Feliciano, to the Pierce School as their new assistant principal. And uh, we'll have an update very soon for you on the K-12 Director of History and Social Studies. We completed the finals for that search this week. Ongoing are finals for the Audison Middle School assistant principal. Um, Ms. Smith is returning to her role as Met co-director. And so we will be replacing her and they are in the final stages of that search. And ongoing are also the finals for K-12 Director of English Language Arts. Also included in your packet are enrollments, and I just want to um, state because it's uh, we heard about it in public comment, and also I've uh, received a number of emails. I just want to reinforce <coughs> that the section sizes for the Hardy School are well within our typical parameters. None of them average above 21 students um, right now, and we're monitoring class sizes very carefully. Um, I'm hoping there's not misinformation circulating, but if anybody wants to email me to inquire about class sizes at any particular grade level, I'm more than happy to provide those to community members. Happy to take any questions. Mr. Cardin, um, so on, on enrollments, you'd mentioned something last time about Stratton that raised a question in my mind. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify how the SLC students are, are currently being counted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they are counted in the total. Enrollment, so they are included in the in that average. They are in that average okay. at every school that has SLCs. So if there's three SLCA students in the first grade at Stratton, they're included in that total. In that total, yes, because they spend time yes, yes. with their that's class, great. and that's so we include them in the total. Right. Yes. Any other questions, uh, Dr. Elson? Um, also on enrollments. Um, anatomy is put down for 100 students for next year, and is that an increase because now we have the extra classroom? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to start 
that's going to be our enrollment at the start of the year, and then as our third graders come in, or three-year-olds, three -year three -year oh, that's probably not because they come, they grow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the school okay. got, the school grows as the year goes on. I know this is a point of frustration because right. of when the October number, <clears throat> October one numbers come in, but we won't be at a hundred to start the school year. Okay. So, because they come in as they turn three, and so they, all the kids will have at the end of the year, we don't have when we start the year. Right, I guess I'm questioning why we're using 100 then. Oh, I see, as the project, as, as the, the projection. Number. Thank you. I would assume that'd be the capacity of the program, right? <clears throat> I, I can find out from, um, just pull it from power school? Yeah, I don't actually know that that was pulled from power school. I think I've always projected that at 100. Um, so what I can do is talk to Joyce about where she's anticipating enrollments coming in at the start of the year. It's um, usually a 20 to 30 gain over the course, over the course of the year. Of the year. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I don't. We're starting officially off at. Yeah, I can see where she what she's thinking will be there on day one because I'm sure she has a sense of that. And we could put that in as the projection number because that's closest. That's most likely to be the October one, closest to the October one number. That's, I'm thinking it should be what's closest to October 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan. I think there's something funny going on with the 2023 and 20, yeah. The projection we can look sheet or? On the projection sheet, those bottom line numbers, the green ones. Because um, right now. Yeah, the out of district line is blank yeah yes mm -hmm. it is which makes them artificially low it's also the confusion that mm. we are in fy 25 but we call it on here 2024 yes which is I, but I get it because that was the year the school year started. So like I kind of really understand why that's how it's labeled. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a holdover from when I started doing this three yeah. years ago. So yeah, no, no, no. I know it's always just year. one of those things that I have to. So I guess it's I, I'm thinking about the oh, I, what would be helpful for me when we're in like June and we're projecting for next year is I want to know what our our net is going to be and if we're going to be lower what the impact is going to be on our budget in the next year right yeah so if we can get some guesstimate for those out of district numbers or something yep yeah we, yeah, we, we, we have them i can update them i haven't updated them with sped in a couple in a couple months so we will do that and i can send an adjustment next Perfect. week at some point anyone else Seeing none, thank you, uh, Dr. Homan. Uh, next up is the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 24300 in the amount of one million sixteen thousand seventy five dollars and fifty cents dated may 29th 2024 and the arlington school committee draft meeting minutes for may 23rd 2024 motion by so moved dr allison ampey seconded by mr thielman uh roll call vote um mr Cardin. yes dr allison ampey yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Chair votes in the affirmative. That's a six nothing unanimous vote. Um, <coughs> subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh. Um, nothing to report, I don't think. Okay. Community relations, Liz Exton is not with us, is there anybody else in community relations who can report? Uh, Ms. Gittleson? Well, we met on Monday when we interviewed the candidates for the naming committee, 
and we are meeting tomorrow afternoon remotely to start the conversation about buffer zones. CIAA, Ms. Morgan. Uh, we are meeting next Friday night at 5.30. <laughs> Because we time. know how to have a good time, mm -hmm. um, and At we which licensed establishment will this meeting? It be will be. Place? It will be here, oh, uh, okay. and we will be talking about the AHS program of studies. Okay, facilities, Mr. Thielman. We meet on uh, next Tuesday, June 11th at 4 p.m. And thank you, here, Dr. Dr. Allison Ampy, for expanding the agenda, policies, and procedures, Mr. Cardin. Uh, nothing to report. You did a great job with the policies earlier. Uh, AHS Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. The project is moving along nicely. Dr. Allison Ampy is going to talk about the plaque. Yeah. So, um, Ms. Dickens, can you bring up the uh, PDF that I sent you? Or can someone and share it on the screen? So, in Novus, uh, it was uploaded late. So. If you didn't see it, it's it's there. There's a proposed dedication plaque. It's a very rough mock-up. Um, it's not. It's going to look much nicer in the final form. It's going to be aluminum with black engraving. Uh, but what this was for is to show the wording and the rough outline of where we would put everything, and uh, it. So the way that we're doing it, um, the AHS, the Building Committee Communications Subcommittee has been tasked with final approval and decision making on this. It has to be done by July 1st, handed off to um, HMFH for the design. And uh, so if we need to make any changes, we can bring the, if, if the school committee has any comments or thoughts about changes, uh, they should be made to me now or, well, we need to do as a group, so it should be done now um, because the 20th is getting a little bit tight for us to be finalizing things for the communication subcommittee. I just want to add one thing. The plaque is, is, is uh, two feet tall by three feet wide it's going to no, be two feet three feet tall three feet tall by two feet wide sorry three feet tall by two feet wide <clears throat> and it's going to be located you want to tell them where it's going to be located? it's going to be located near the rear entrance uh, to the right of the door as you come in so it's going to be designed and then when the building is ready it'll be we'll have a full dedication ceremony and stuff so i know that there was some thought of whether the school committee members should be mentioned on the plaque um, and that I'm happy to bring that suggestion back to the communications subcommittee. The building committee has final to say, but if our group votes that we think we should have school committee names on there too, um, I'm happy to bring that back and we can probably figure out a way to make it happen. Um, Just one procedural point, if I could, I'm sorry, to, it is the, um, uh, so the high school building committee voted to authorize the communications subcommittee to make the final call on the design, the names on the on the on the uh, plaque. So and the wording and the wording, yeah. So it's sort of it's in their hands uh, to do by the end of this month. <clears throat> right. So thank goodness they got your name on one line in this version. You're right. Look at that. Need the numbers more. I made the words smaller. Yeah, so I think Mr. Schlickman's passing around a copy of the Gibbs. So the Gibbs has the school committee on it. The Thompson does not. Um, Minuteman did. So it's, you know, it can go either way. Uh, and... Uh, I, 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 my commentary is I think it's inappropriate to exclude the school committee from a plaque for the dedication of the school for the school department. Uh, I have worked in many school buildings and been in and out of many school buildings and it is 
and the past Arlington practice to exclude the school committee was really kind of bizarre, and we talked about it uh, when we opened uh, Gibbs, and we made a change in that process uh, to what I think was correcting a wrong. And I really, really, really would not like to see this go forward without the school committee also being included. Any other discussion under this item? AJ. <clears throat> so I think Dr. Allison Ampey is going to take back whatever recommendation the committee wants to make. So we're, we're, we're right. going to hear what, the recommend, what thoughts people have. I will only say this one thing about the plaques, just so you know. The Thompson School had my last name spelled wrong, and this one uh, had my first name spelled wrong. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we're hoping to get the third one right. <clears throat> so plaques. You know, you don't want to get middle name. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there. It's a public document, probably somewhere. Okay. I know. That, just, uh, just, just, just to kind of throw that uh, in. Mr. Seelman must have missed the email from Ms. Bodie, uh, Dr. Bodie, when she uh, asked. I probably to did. Include the, the names. <clears throat> or I might have read it. Do we need to mention the architects and? Construction um, companies like we did at Gibbs, or yeah, we it's it's there. Oh, there it is. There. Yeah, it's there. So, what do folks think? <clears throat> we're we're going to take it back to the uh, Dr. Allison Ambit is going to take it back to the communication subcommittee, and um, they have the final call. It's our history, um, and we're a part of it. Bueller? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any strong opinions either way. Right. <laughs> I okay. also, I don't, I don't feel strongly either way. Okay, why don't we, we'll, we'll take, we'll take sort of the chair's opinion and, uh, and, and, and Dr. Allison Ampey will share this with the subcommittee, this past history, and let, and we'll talk it through with the, the subcommittee and you'll figure it out. I don't know what else to do at this point. Do you? Okay. So I think if, if the chair wants to make a motion. <laughs> right. That, that's <coughs> uh, yeah. The chair usually doesn't, so I, I but I will. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Ms. Morgan may chair the meeting at this point. Super. Ms. <laughs> um, Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman, would you like to speak? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. <laughs> and, uh, uh, request the uh, committee to include the names of the school committee on the dedication plaque. I will second for discussion purposes. Chair? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're ready to we just, <laughs> we just make this be over? Oh <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left for you people. Okay. You're going to have um, to run the next meeting, so let, let, let's. Okay. Get All your right. Practice. So great. So we have a motion by Mr. Schlickman and seconded by Mr. Cardin. Discussion on the motion. Is the intention that the members of the building committee are going to vote on this motion as members of the school committee? I'm going to abstain. I'm going to abstain. I yeah. just, yeah, well, I, then I, we're I, not going to get to a. No, you can't. You, you no, get you can't. The, it would be the majority of people present yeah. in voting. No, no, we're, 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 we have, there's still a quorum. So, Okie dokie. Uh, if, as long as you get a majority of the people excluding the abstentions. All right, I will speak to the motion. I don't feel comfortable making an official request. I think you've heard about the history, um, and I think it would be nice if the subcommittee discussed the involvement of the school committee, which is clearly much secondary to the involvement of the building committee, and then consider whether or not it's appropriate in this, in this place or somewhere else in the building, or nowhere. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to speak to it, Mr. Schlickman, um, further? Yeah, I, th this is our history, and we're the ones receiving this project. We've done a lot of political work in order to uh, make this project happen. Uh, uh, we've worked very hard in terms of getting elected to this committee to advance this project and to advance the debt exclusion 
Um, and this is our history as a town. In 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, people who are entering this school should have the right to see this part of our history as well, to not only know who was on the building committee, but to also have the school committee names of, of the folks who were in office at this point in our history uh, reflected on the plaque. Um, to exclude us uh, erases this, this committee from its history. Dr. Alice Nampy. Um, so one thought, so I don't know why we can't get this pulled up on the screen, but. Oh, if I've got open, it on my screen. I am looking at it. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, if you look at the actual too. thing. Vividly. Do you want me if to, here, do you want instead me to of having it in two columns as we did, if we have a, another line um, centered says with additional recognition to, and then the first column says former building committee members, and has those people. The middle line is project partners and has the uh, project managers uh, and the architect and stuff. And then the other line is school committee. And then it'll have the names, because um, part of the problem is who on the school committee do we put on this, right? Because it's not just us. It's you know, we should be thinking about people before, but we can put a number, we could add a number of school committee members in that and somehow designate, you know, put asterisks on Jeff and I uh, that, and something that indicates that we're school committee members. Uh, and Mr. So. Pierce, who was also a former school committee. No, that's what I mean. It, mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, mm -hmm. I guess, anyway, it's a way of, adding it and it does it while allowing us to put a list without it having to be the, um, just the current school committee members or something. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm going to bring the sense of the committee and that's what I'm hoping to get to. I guess my feelings, like, I, it, I, I'm not much for plaques, <coughs> personally. Um, so, and it's, I mean, it's something we're talking about. We're now 12, 13, 14 minutes in mm -hmm. <laughs> to this conversation. So it's clearly important to some people, you know, it's clearly important to some people. So I guess, um, that's that's the part that's tricky for me. Generally, my sort of I'm like, let's just have more people because that's like more is better. I don't really understand the parameters of three feet by two feet, and there's not enough space and this, that, and other. I I don't know it. Um, I have no investment personally, um, so uh, yeah. I guess I I I'm sort of like agree with. Mr. Cardin at the moment, I don't, like, I'm the newest member of this committee. I, I don't feel comfortable voting to put my name on a building that, I don't know, that's, I, I, I understand Mr. Schlichtman's argument, but as a personal matter, it feels like a, a funny thing for me to be voting on. I also think it's a funny thing to be voting on. I really don't like the fact that we were put in a position where we were asked to vote on it. Well, why, why don't we, I mean, well then, why don't we not vote? I, Dr. Allison Ampey can take this, the conversation back to the group. And I withdraw I'll, my motion. And they'll, and they'll figure it out. And they'll, they'll take everything into account. They'll do a good job. I withdraw my motion. Great. Super. Next agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Um, now I've got to figure out where we're at. Future school committee meetings. Future, oh, future school committee me meetings. Guess who's going to get the gavel next uh, meeting? <laughs> Uh, we have a meeting scheduled on the 20th. We sort of had ambitions to not have it, which is sort of what we've tried to do, but it looks like there are things that are still lurking and the things we must be doing before the end of the year that we will need to do it, including a budget transfer, including the appointment of a school physician, and I, I, anything else in this uh, wonderful list of undone things, Dr. Holmes? Mm, you said budget transfer, right? Budget transfer, yeah. yeah. That's the big one. Those are the two major things, which shouldn't take too much time. Um, 
but uh, we're going to need to do it, and I will not be in town for that, so it will be uh, the joys of uh, Ms. Morgan organizing this and making sure the meeting runs smoothly, which she is fully capable of doing. It's true. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're still uh, <coughs> contemplating the idea of a retreat, but I don't have a proposal for us right now. I think I'd like to discuss this with uh, Dr. Allison Ampey at some point and sort of create sort of an ad hoc little group, to working group, to see if we can't put something together without the objection. Uh, so future school committee meetings. Motion in, to adjourn. No, we're adjourn. going to executive session. Motion to move to executive session. And uh, all of a sudden my thing is spinning so I can't read the screen. Here. Let me pull. I, I've got the paper here. Oh, look at uh, that. Yeah, old timey. Um, executive session motion. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to go into executive s session to discuss the deployment of security personnel or devices or strategies with respect thereto. And we will not be returning to open session. We'll be re uh, adjourning from the executive session. Uh, motion by me. Uh, Ms. Morgan, second by. Dr. Allison Ampey, uh, this has to be a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Exton is still not with us. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And the chair votes the affirmative six nothing. We are in executive session. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.